Hello and welcome to episode 34 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 2nd of April 2018. I'm Joe and with me are Jesse. Out with the old, in with the new. I key. I'm going. <laughs> and Graham. Hello. Graham, who's who's that? Well, obviously it's Graham Morrison of Linux Voice fame. So uh, Phelim is not with us today because he is shitting through the eye of a needle. And uh, so Graham has kindly stepped in. Uh, so thanks a lot for doing that, Graham. No problem. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah, no worries. We will uh, get back to that a bit later and the things that Ike has alluded to there and Jesse. But first, let's talk a little bit about some news. And the first one is a two-factor authenticator for Linux. Yes, this is covered on OMG Ubuntu, and I use two-factor authentication on all of what I consider the major websites. Uh, and I have a little, I can't remember who makes it actually, the little key that you put in the USB and press it down. And it, YubiKey? YubiKey, that's the one. Um, and so I use that for uh, two-factor on, on many things, and I just thought it was useful to know that there is now a desktop application uh, actually because now it sort of is the key thing to know these days for some reason. Uh, it's a flat pack, so you can, in theory, install it on anything. And, yeah, you get, get a desktop application for two-factor, and it covers all the major websites that you might think of, so Amazon and Dropbox and Google and Facebook and LastPass and all those sorts of things. And I think the sort of people that listen to this show are, are familiar with two-factor it's the sensible thing to do and anything that you can use to make it that little bit easier by logging on you know on your desktop not having to get a outside thing like i do i have to go walk over to my keys and get it and walk back and faff around isn't that the point with two-factor authentication that the authentication isn't on the same machine that you're using to authenticate and gives you physical security but it then uh messages back I think it messages back, you can set, select what that message comes to. So you just type in the code from your phone, which is, you know, with you. Yeah. So my, my two-factor is a physical thing that is on my keys. I have to walk to the USB port, whereas this recognizes that you're logging in and pings a message to your phone that you then log in with. Oh, okay. So it doesn't appear inside the app itself. Yeah. So, you, so it does require you to remember your phone, but I think these days most people are not very far from their phones. Even Ike these days is not far from his phone. Yeah, I use my phone now. <laughs> and so this is called Authenticator. We should have mentioned that. And it's GPL v2, which is all well and good. So, uh, yeah, do check it out if you're looking to do two-factor. Um, sad news. We kind of knew it already, but Firefox OS is officially dead. The App Store has been shut down at the end of March. And so Firefox OS is no more, not even on TVs and stuff. It's a shame Phelan isn't here because he had a couple of the phones and he likes to curse them for being absolutely shit. But um, Graham, did you ever have any uh, experience with Firefox OS? Um, I played with it back in the day, um, but I've always been quite cynical about anything outside of the main kind of OSs that are going to get enough traction to mean anything. So I don't know. Mozilla's changed itself since the days of Firefox OS, so it's probably probably a positive move. But it kind of was supposed to maybe live on on TVs and stuff, but... It seems that WebOS and other OSs are just filling that niche and there's just no interest in Firefox OS. There's probably no interest in a transparent network layer that uh, can't easily be hacked into sending data back to whatever television company is running the OS. <laughs> yeah, I suspect that might have something to do with it. But um, yeah, I thought we'd better mention it anyway. It, it's it's kind of sad. It was At one stage, it was the great hope, wasn't it? And now... Sailfish is kind of a hope, but there's a bit too much proprietary bullshit in that for my tastes. And so now, really, apart from what Purism are doing, which is a bit of a moonshot, to be fair, you've only really got um, UbiPorts, Ubuntu Touch, which seems to be ticking along nicely, but we'll just have to see what works out with that. Yeah, but that's never going to be major mainstream, is it? I mean, Ubuntu had all of its push behind it and couldn't get it out the door effectively. Um, and so I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think it's ever going to make it in in the big wide world of, of iOS and, and Google. But I, I wonder there, Graham, the point you made, I, I agree with the point you made about if it's not going to have a, uh, a chance to challenge the main two, what's the point? Yeah. But then does your view extend then to 
well, there's nothing that's going to challenge it because you have to have that sort of mainstream network effect? Or do you think there is a possibility of, of having a triopoly rather than a duopoly? I don't think so. Um, I think probably the best example is um, the beginnings of GNU Linux itself. Um, the really, I mean, Microsoft was incredibly dominant. And the real, the, while there were obviously other OSs, Linux came and captured a specific kind of niche that wasn't being serviced. And until a phone OS can do the same thing, and I don't think kind of being open source is enough of one, I can't see it happening until it provides something different that everybody kind of jumps on and makes an important part of what the OS is. I mean, look at it this way. Samsung already tried with Tizen. And if Samsung can't do it, how is anybody else going to do it? Yeah, but Tizen isn't completely dead. Yeah, but I mean, it mostly lives on in their fridges and a small selection of watches. It was originally going to be like the dominant, you know, competing OS that was going to be on phones. It was going to be on tablets. It was going to be here, there and everywhere. And basically, to all intents, it's completely flopped because back in the day, it wasn't just Samsung for a while. It was Samsung and Intel. Then it was just Samsung. And now you don't really hear about it because nobody's got any interest with it. And if they can't step up to the likes of Apple when they actually make a lot of the chips that Apple even use, how the hell is anyone else going to do it? Like You just cannot go for the mainstream anymore. That yeah. is completely cornered. You have to find something. As Graham said, you have to find a niche. To me, it seems like it has to be Android. It has to be like a conglomerate of interested, significant, influential parties who take Android and make it open and make it accountable um, outside of Google's ecosystem. Yeah, but Google keeps putting in more and more proprietary stuff to Android and AOSP is just becoming just gutted, isn't it, really? I feel it's doing that precisely because that it's that's its great weakness with Android. You know, the more kind of hooks it can put into the system, the harder it's going to be. And so it's going to be harder from this point onwards. It's going to be hard from two years onwards. But, you know, it's still the best choice, I think, the best hope. Sort of sounds very Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so difficult not to be cynical about the state of, you know, data and privacy and who owns our phone OS. But I think it's kind of, I feel like it's naive at this point to worry too much about the OS when everybody's going to just run Facebook on the OS anyway. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the hooks that are going into the operating system. It's not really so much as the software that's going in. It's the service-driven aspect yeah, of everything. Yeah. Google Play services, you know, like even on my phone, I'm constantly getting updates for things I can't remove and don't want, but I know that they have all the permissions in the world. They're running in the background. So again, it's not really the core of the operating system. It's all of the services everyone wants to be subscribed to because it makes their lives easier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll get back to that later on, but... um. Let's move on to talk about Cloudflare. Now, this is not technically Linux or even really open source, but I think it is very important to uh, the rest of us. And so Cloudflare have launched their own DNS service, which is to rival Google DNS, essentially. And they've managed to get 1.1.1.1, <laughs> yeah. which is pretty impressive. And probably very expensive, to be fair. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jesse, you seem quite enthusiastic about this. So actually, segueing from the, the discussion about trusting Google and these sorts of things, so I have uh, a pie hole, which basically sees um, DNS queries that go to advertising sites and just cuts them out. So in theory, uh, inside my network, no matter what device you're using, it should have fewer waste, fewer amounts of wasted data going about and, and fewer adverts. Now, for that to work, you have to say what um, proper DNS location you want it what you want to use as so i just use 8.8.8.8 you know you're going to use a google server it's going to be fast it's got you know all the traffic it needs all the servers it needs great and so i'm trusting google with that dns uh traffic and what cloudflare are saying are use us we're faster here's the graph to prove it and we promise not to do anything bad with your data now as far as i'm concerned you know you, you can say naive by all means but you're choosing two companies that I don't know whether one is much more trustworthy or not than the other, but one is faster and is actively saying they're promising privacy and security. So, you know, why why shouldn't you trust them and go with it? Because Cloudflare's whole business model involves trying to route the entire internet through their servers. And that is just, quite frankly, a suspicious business model to me. <laughs> it's the same with Google, though. I mean, that's the, the one thing with Google is that I could always remember 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8 .8. And I think in those instances, I'll type in 1.1.1.1. .1 .1 .1. 
Do you not worry that Cloudflare is trying to just dominate this this internet thing and and trying to just completely own all the data, or well, not own it, or but but have it all come through their house, as it were? You're right, but it's at least it by fragmenting the services by having some of those things going through Cloudflare and some of them going through Google. It's you haven't given the same person all your data. Uh, and you've had pretty good experience with Cloudflare, haven't you, with um, the Linux Voice site in terms of their anti DDoS stuff and the uh, caching and everything. Yeah, they say they saved our bacon. Yeah, um, they they offer a fantastic service and their their free tier, you know, is saving lots of people like us from the denial of services you inevitably get if you're any kind of public project. And so they actually provide a great service in that capacity. And I don't blame them for trying to monetize it in in the way that they're doing it. And their promises don't mean anything. It's a bit like do no evil. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm i sorry. It's just that there's a generation out there that are a lot younger than me that care so little about privacy. They, they haven't been brought up with 8-bit processes that don't share anything. I find it's going to be a really difficult battle to fight and to win. And I, I really don't know the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to have a DNS server and you're going to pick between two major companies, yeah. it, why don't you just pick the one that's fastest? Why not just use your ISP like a normal person? <laughs> because that's very, very bad. <laughs> yeah, BT will do whatever. They'll be even worse. <laughs> That's how you get cut off from the internet by your provider because they know exactly what you're doing. Like everyone's like, "Oh yeah, you use Tor." It's like, eh, you've still got to do DNS requests. <laughs> you yeah. still got to look up those things." So I, I'd use this. In fact, I will use this. There you go. In fact, if anything, we should be, you know, saying how important the DNS is because it's because it's slightly on the technical side. It's difficult to explain to someone exactly how fundamental it is to almost everything that your electronic devices do. You know, it's probably better to give people some awareness of what it does. Or I don't know the EFF after after. Let's encrypt. They should set up their own DNS service. That would be the thing to do. Yeah, I'd be much more inclined to trust something from um, maybe even the Linux Foundation, Mozilla, and the FF could get together or something. They could call it Let's Look Up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> Hold on, let's register that now. Yeah. <laughs> let's park on the domain. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, well, we've spent the last couple of episodes bashing the copy leftists and the FSF and everything. So let's continue that tradition. So there's a Pharonix article about the Linux Libra 4.16 that was released uh, today, I think. And because the Spectre and Meltdown mitigations require proprietary software, um, it's not even going to warn you about that. It's not going to encourage you to download those blobs, which you would kind of expect from the Libra kernel. But at the same time, it's not a great situation, is it, that they're prioritizing software freedom over security? I'm right in saying that there isn't a a free um, version of this microcode that you could install. Oh, no, very much not. Exactly. So as far as I can see, this is basically, you know, you've got a patient with an illness and the doctor says, here's the pill, but it's tested on animals, so you can't have it. It's like, well... It's my choice if I, you know, if, if I have that moral choice between pills or potions that are tested on animals versus having this illness, I will make that decision. And it sounds like they've just taken this option out of your hands without giving you an alternative. Like there's no alternative pill for the illness, so it's my choice as to whether I take it or not. If there's no alternative uh, free version of the, the microcode, then you don't get to choose whether I know about it or not. It should be my choice. Jesse, 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 I am shocked. Do you think that you know freedom better than someone with free in their name? That's absolutely scandalous. But yeah, they are fucking gobshites for this altogether. Like, there's just no need for this carry on. You should at least provide a warning. By the way, do you know that thing that fixed the thing that scared the shite out of the world? You have this. <laughs> They should do something, at least allow you to do, to choose to do your BIOS updates or something so you're able to get around it. As much as they might not provide the microcode loading ability, you can still do BIOS updates and bypass that. At least provide a warning, because at that point, you're then trying to seize control of the freedom of the hardware as well as the software. And frankly, they don't have any fucking business doing that. But I don't really have a strong opinion on it, so I will give back to you guys. <laughs> 
So, Graham, you said the dreaded GNU slash Linux or GNU Linux earlier, and I have heard you be pretty pro copyleft in the past, so defend them. <laughs> you Okay, so I'll play devil's advocate. It's actually, it's very difficult to play uh, devil's advocate in this instance. Um, I, th- I do think they should clearly state why they're not um, promoting the microcode and, and why they can't promote it. If they feel like they've, they've had this problem with phone OSs linking back to the past with the FSF, if they feel like they can't create a phone OS because they simply don't have access to the, the low-level bits of microcode that they can include, the same with the CPU, they should clearly state it. And I do feel they should be clearly stating it in this instance. Um, if That's the best I can do at defending them because... You know, I think it basically makes the OS redundant. Um, and that is their great issue as a, a, a free Libra OS. That is the issue that we all have. And the best they, they can do, once again, I think, is publicize that issue. And it's infringing on your rights that they can't provide open source versions of the microcode to fix the bugs and have to rely on Intel. I think the sanest and kind of scariest summary of the whole thing is they are placing more value on their own philosophy than that of their own users. And that's kind of worrying. Like their philosophy means far more to them than their users do. I think um, to play the devil's advocate again, maybe there's the curse of knowledge involved in this and that they're expecting the people who who know about the case, the issue, to understand their reasoning. Maybe they're simply guilty of that rather than making kind of um, a, a, a bad decision on whether they publish this i think that's probably it's very difficult to second guess what these people are thinking and i think that's slightly the truth to be honest i think they're probably they realize they think they're making a big point with this when in reality to most people it's going to look like the opposite it's going to look like posturizing and more capital f freedom yeah well the, on the last episode when we talked about stallman and how he re- responded to my emails and stuff it's that same thing that like they end up shooting themselves in the foot by having such well by sticking to their principles so strongly that and not having a, any pragmatism at all it, it means that you end up just alienating people essentially yeah but i think as as time has gone on i personally accept that as their role their role is to have no pragmatism and i think they're very successful at actually defining what their terms are and sticking to them. And I'm actually, I'm grateful for that. Um, whether that actually makes a difference, I, I don't know. But I, I always know what their stance is going to be on things and what Stormman's stance is going to be. And I quite like that as a lighthouse, you know, out in the distance somewhere to see how far off course I'm going. Well, I did think that before. I used to kind of talk about them pulling on one end and then you've got sort of Apple and stuff and Microsoft to the other end. But having had that encounter with Stallman, it just made me think, fuck them, quite frankly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's uh, it was so immensely frustrating to try and talk to him. that, uh, And then you've got a couple of other people who've tried to defend that position and stuff. And just that stubbornness and the, the arrogance as well and the the superiority but anyway let's not go down that road again and we'll just alienate more of the uh, copy leftists yeah long story short we just need either somebody else tugging on the rope now or they need to hire somebody in pr badly yeah that's a good idea yeah um okay so on to a bit of admin then um first of all thank you everyone for supporting us on paypal and patreon uh, the patreon has grown a little bit this month so uh, yes very much appreciated and if you want to join those people go to late night linux.com slash support and there's various other ways even uh, bitcoin and stuff although i haven't checked that for a while uh, and if you want to get in contact with us late night linux.com slash contact various ways including the telegram group which is definitely the best way to get us directly but if not there's email and stuff like that there uh, even facebook i think um okay so uh there was a major spoiler at the top of the show about Ike and Jesse, but um, let's cover the simpler one first. So Jesse, this is your last show for a while because you are about to become a father for the first time. So congratulations. You've, uh, you're about to contribute another problem to the world. Well done. Thank you very much. My carbon footprint will go up a little bit. Um, 
I know that's your biggest worry. So, uh, yes, my uh, fiance is due on the 5th and we record this. That's like four days away. So it's all very uh, likely to happen sometime soon over the next few weeks. And it means I'm very unlikely to make the next show. Even this show was a little bit uh, up in the air. And so we've sort of had a, a chat behind the scenes and agreed that I'll take uh, probably three months off. So six shows and hopefully by then things have... Uh, maybe not settle down, but some sort of routine or some sort of agreement with the missus as to how we juggle things on a on a Monday when we record. And yeah, so I'll be off the show for a little while, but with a promise to come back. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. And I suppose the other one is pretty straightforward. Ike, you're fucking off and never coming back. Uh, see you around, bye. <laughs> <laughs> so you're making major life changes, aren't you, is the bottom line here. Yeah, basically. Um I'm sort of doing the whole work-life balance thing and effectively I just want more time that I could use to build a home life and that sort of means that once I'm finished with the computer in the day because bearing in mind obviously you know I'm, I'm working from home on the computer all day so it's kind of once it gets to the evening apart from today obviously I know today is the evening late night Linux apart from today then I will just be getting off the computer completely stopping that'll be the same for weekends as well I won't be working at the weekends and that's sort of my time. And yeah, I mean, I bought myself a guitar. <laughs> Genuinely, like this is not a midlife crisis at all, you know. It's a bit <laughs> early. Wait until I do have one. But yeah, that and sort of me van out getting back on the road, you know, just looking after me a bit. Yeah, doing real life instead of too much internet, essentially. Yeah, I mean, like I've been putting the changes in place now for the last couple of months. So say two or three months, I've been sort of, moving in this direction and you know i mean i've been biking every day walking i've lost over 20 pounds in weight as well just by starting to pay a bit of attention to myself you know so it it's paying off and it just means that i will build up a bit of a personal life which i've slightly neglected since i don't know when was the last famine yeah but yeah it's 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 got to be done like i've got to look after myself for once so we did talk about this on twitter and stuff um uh, and we had a lot of people applying for the job to replace you, essentially. Um, so thank you, everyone, for that. Um, one of the big questions that everyone had was, oh, no, will I keep you back occasionally to give us updates on Solus and stuff? So that's my question to you. Are you willing to come back once in a while? I mean, we'll see how it goes, because you know yourself, things like this, you, you never say never. And, uh... Yeah. But not for not in the uh, not certainly not in the short term then. And not in the short term, no. Like I've, I've a lot to get sorted out. Like even this month is completely hectic. People are going to think I'm having a breakdown from this, but it's hard to cut them now. Like you know yourself and get my van sorted out. Um, even got like my tattoo to get at the end of the month. Like this sort of stuff, personal life stuff. Uh, so like this month, probably the next couple of months, I won't really be gone on anything. Like it won't just be this. Like it, I won't be gone on anything, but. I don't know, a few months down the line, we'll see where we are and, you know, pop back as a guest, give you all a bit of slagging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we definitely need to hear about Solus and stuff. You can uh, be, instead of being told to shut up about Solus, you'll I'll be, be allowed to talk to... about it. Here, I might even have Solus far out by then. You never know, <laughs> strange things have happened. Um, and so we needed two replacements, essentially, one temporary and one permanent we have not decided exactly what's happening. Um, we're far too disorganized for that. However, uh, Graham, who you have been hearing from so far, is one of those replacements. And the other one is Will Cook, who is the director of Ubuntu Desktop. So he's quite a big wig at Canonical. But don't worry, we're not going to be turning it into the Ubuntu podcast. We'll still be giving him plenty of shit for how terrible Gnome is, or at least I will. <laughs> um so, yeah, that's going to be the situation for a while. When Jesse comes back, who knows? We may have five people on the show. Uh, we may have some sort of rotation. Maybe Graham or Will will be sick of it after a few shows. We just don't know. We could give you guys buzzers and you could kind of, you know, buzz us off or buzz us on. You could call it Podcast of the Week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, look, it's a good problem to have, to have too many people who you want to have on the show. So we'll we'll work something out. But um Yes, Ike, you will be missed, but the show must go on, as they say. And so um, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Well, thanks for suffering <laughs> me all this time. It's It's been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been fantastic. We we should just absolutely clarify that, you know, this is 
Ike's choice and and wishes to go, but there's and there's departing on friendly level terms despite the banter. There's not like a, a sort of rising venom in the background. It's 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 all good. It's just sad sad to see him go. That's not what you said earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to say it on air this way though. Yeah, look, I spoke to Ike about this quite a lot and said, "Are you really sure? Are you really sure?" Because I don't like change essentially, and things were going well with this show and so i didn't want him to leave but i totally understand why you have to man it's you know life is sometimes more important than stuff like this so um i mean it just all comes down to personal discipline and that's basically you know it in a nutshell yeah well maybe once things get totally sorted out in months or you know even beyond that you uh you may be back and um oh yeah i mentioned that everyone had um sent us in audio clips and everything I am always planning to do new shows is the bottom line. Um, I always have at least two or three in the pipeline, but I will never speak about them until I know they are definitely happening. So I'm not going to give you any more details than that. But of the people who applied, you will certainly be um, kept in my mind for new uh, possible shows, especially if they're going to be Linux related or whatever. So it wasn't a complete waste of time sending us them in. But hopefully with Graham and Will on board and me and Phelan, we'll be able to uh, keep doing a decent show that people will enjoy. And um, you will be missed, Ike, but, you know, the show goes on. So this episode of Late Night Linux is sponsored by Entroware. Go to entroware.com. And they are a dedicated Linux computer seller based here in the UK. And they sell computers with Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate 1604 and 1710. And I say every time, but they are a company who cares about Linux. This is all they do. They just sell computers running Ubuntu. And I have got one of them and Jesse's got one of them. And we have tried out many different distros. They're not officially supported by Entroware, but don't think that they're only going to run Ubuntu. If it runs Ubuntu, the chance site it's going to run Fedora or Arch or whatever perfectly well. And they've got a huge range of laptops from affordable stuff all the way up to real powerhouses with the latest NVIDIA chips. So you're bound to find something to suit your budget. And they've also got desktops and servers. And like the laptops, almost everything is configurable from the storage and RAM and some of the CPUs you can upgrade. So you're bound to find something that is just right for you. And they ship to the UK, Republic of Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And if you do buy one of their machines, then do mention us at checkout. There's a drop-down box there. Put in Late Night Linux and we'll know that we sent you. So go to entroware.com for all your Linux computing needs. All right, everyone's doing it. So let's talk about Facebook, Yawn, and Cambridge Analytica. Um, Right, quick go around. Who here actually uses Facebook? I get notifications on my phone of other people doing interesting things on Facebook, but I cannot remember the last time I posted something. Okay, I post the shows on there, but apart from that, I just lurk a couple of accounts. Uh, Graham, you you're not even on there, are you? Um, no, I'm not on there. I've, I've I've never had a Facebook account, which is actually a slight lie because I've got an account from a long time ago that I maybe like you, I used to stalk people if I have to find a way in somehow. I didn't say stalk. I said lurk. It's very different. <laughs> I certainly don't have the app on my phone. See, this is the reason I don't have Facebook anymore, because people used to stalk me. <laughs> okay, so um, Romeo Sid Vicious, definitely not a fake name, got in touch with us to suggest that we talked about some blockchain-based alternatives. Um, I, I don't want to go into them specifically. I mean, you get the idea with them sort of decentralized Um diaspora is uh is that how you say it or is it diaspora or whatever anyway that is the kind of poster child for decentralized social networks um and i suppose mastodon to some extent but at the end of the day no one's using them are they no and that's the point isn't it i guess the best decentralized um network like that was fidonet if ever if you <laughs> used bbs's back in the day no we're not quite as old as you i'm afraid <laughs> That, so that that was a system that worked on bulletin board system that worked on people running com- their computers attached to modems. So you'd have three or four modem connections. And then at like three in the morning, whatever messages were posted on your FidoNet bulletin board were copied across to somebody next to you and they'd kind of ricochet on that way. And it worked really well, but that was because there was no alternative. There was no alternative and, dare I say it, not that many people. I mean, the number of people that are using social networks these days are in the billions 
and the size of the servers and the throughput and the duplication and sharing it. Like the diaspora sort of model, it, it says it's decentralized, but it's only as decentralized, in my view, as Facebook but just not using Facebook's own servers. So you have these pods and people, you know, that pod holds the information for you, but then that's then shared with the next pod and what have you, and you connect locally. But that must be the same as Facebook and Google Plus and everything because they have their own servers knocking around the world. It's as decentralized. It's just that you trust the people who use it more. Well, yeah, Facebook's decentralized insofar as there are data centers all over the world running it yeah. that, that, that talk to each other. but none of those standards are open, are they? Whereas with Diaspora, it's all like open source, open standards, and anyone can run their own node. Yeah, but you, again, you can't have one in your house because your, you know, your domestic internet bandwidth is not going to be big enough for when 3 million people in the UK suddenly want to post and check and download. So it's going to have to be somewhere that has a serious internet connection. I don't think they're going to have 3 million people using Diaspora somehow. No, no but if, what I'm saying is you've got, to, you've got to consider the scale that it could get to if you're going to be a, a major social network. And so it has to have that ability to have a big throughput. And so you're going to be in a company, a university, some sort of somewhere that has that sort of throughput and it's going to require money and it's going to require infrastructure and before you know it you're paying for it or uh the people who are running it that have that ability to have that net that that node are going to be like Facebook. I think one of the big things that changed with with all of this was the loss of anonymity and the loss of being able to use a pseudonym or the fact that you had to use your real name. That used to be a very important part of how social networks worked and how people expressed themselves online. And for a variety of reasons, good and bad, you know, that's fallen by the wayside for all of the major services, Facebook and Google. And that's a huge loss in many ways. Um, I think that's as important as the federalization of the servers that hold the data. But you know what has caused that is the invention of the smartphone. Because before the smartphone, there was only weirdos like us on the internet. Yeah. And then the smartphone came along and then everyone, you know, all the normals came along. And that's when they just started using their real names and stuff. I mean, the idea of using your real name on the internet to me is just ridiculous. <laughs> so I disagree with the smartphone one because if... Uh, Facebook came to me when I was at university, so late in university, Facebook was the thing that everyone was doing. But that was pre-smartphones. That was definitely still in dumb phones, whatever they're called. And so that was people logging in. I mean, when I went to university, you had to pay extra to get an internet connection to your room. So, you know, that's, that's where we were. And so... It's not so much smartphone, but like I agree with Graham's point that Facebook, you have to log in with quotes your real name. Um, and so it says, oh, what's your first name? What's your surname? Here you are. By using your real name, people can find you. You can find other people. Your network increases. I'm interested to hear Graham's reason that using your real name, uh, sorry, having a pseudonym is a good thing. Because surely by having uh, your real name, you're less likely to be a nasty, evil internet troll. Yeah, that's true. And you're right. But I think the real, the real reason for not using your real name is that you are in complete control of your social network. Only people who know who you are will necess or what you say, maybe, will necessarily care to follow you or you follow them, um, which to me is the core reason why you would want to be part of a social network. But yes, I think if if there's a yin and a yang to this equation, it's the fact that you get so many. It's it's the the feedback loop of hate, and I think over the last ten years that has proven to be a much stronger force and a force that really needs to be curtailed far more perhaps than the rights of having an anonymous account on any of these services. And that's a pity. Maybe we need this elite service just for like metropolitan elite Brexiteers. <laughs> <laughs> You just couldn't go a whole show without mentioning it, could you? So, Ike, you were quite into Mastodon for a while. About 11 minutes. No, I think it was a little bit more than that. What drove you off it? Was it the fact that there weren't many people on there, or was it just that they were all dickheads? No, it was the people that were on there. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go into too many details about it, but effectively there is a culture of hate against normality. 
on Macedon. <laughs> That's a very, very good way to explain it. Yeah. You see where I'm going with that, right? Yes. Yes. There is an extreme culture of hatred against normality on Macedon. If for any reason you are seen to conform to social norms or what would be classed as standards, shall we say, then you're outcast. You you are blacklisted. People don't want anything to do with you and people will attack you for it. Basically for the way that you was born, which yeah, basically, fuck that entirely. Um, it's a shit show. I want nothing to do with it. But while on the topic of this whole thing about people using their smartphones to get notifications about social networks. So my reason for being on Google+, Plus, apart from just like to torment the living shite out of people with all of my shit posts, with all of the music and stuff. <laughs> YouTube, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's mostly done in, in a professional capacity. <laughs> in a professional capacity, i.e. it's always almost always related into Solus so people can sort of see the person behind Solus but people only see then what I want them to see I'm not on the likes of Facebook and obviously it was in the past but people are looking at their phones to get the notification the same thing you use to fucking ring people and catch up then go around to their house knock on their door and go talk to them like not everything has to be on social media I that's kind of what we lost. We've lost like the, the neighborhoodly world we had before. And I think where you'd go to see family and you'd go to see friends at the weekend or after work. That's what people should be doing. Not sitting there saying, I've got 597,000 friends on Facebook. No, you don't. You have four. So, yeah, I think people should get back to reality and just fuck social media off entirely because all you're trying to do is present the best possible version of yourself to other people as you believe they want to see you. Just get rid of that shite and just be human to other humans. However, you are coming across as a very old man by saying that kind of stuff. Because let's face it, the four of us on this Mumble server right now know each other through the internet. Maybe not through social media as you would expect, Facebook or whatever, but like through the internet. That's how we all know each other. And Yeah, but I mean, that's culturally different from the, the likes of what's going on on Facebook because Facebook nowadays is very, very toxic. Everyone knows what's there. It's going to be drama and backstabbing. That's basically what it exists for. Instagram, fucking rename it dial ride because that's all it exists for. Like, the social media we have now isn't the social media we had yesterday. When Facebook started out, it was effectively a way for old friends to get back in contact with each other who had no means to do so before. And it was targeted at older generations. What, they had friends reunited? <laughs> it's basically the same sort of thing, right? Well, initially it was like elitism for college kids. You needed an invitation, didn't you? Yeah, and now look at it today. Like, everyone has to be on Facebook. You're, you can't, like on my phone here, I know, Joe, it's a random phone. I know it's a random <laughs> phone but i cannot remove the facebook app that's how much is pushed on me that i must use facebook that i cannot remove facebook from my phone despite the fact i don't use it if i want to log into a website or if i want to make a comment on something here why don't you log in with facebook like it's forced on every one of us that we have to use social media to get anything done and to be normal at that point you got to look at it and say actually this is not normal and perhaps i should sidestep all this shite but we don't. Us four don't, do we? None of us. No, because we copped ourselves on. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I use Twitter primarily, and really that's not much different from Facebook, is it, in terms of privacy and all that? I bet if we ask people nowadays, like, if you were to talk to, like, I don't just mean people, people, like, I mean people that you know. I think you find that nowadays people aren't using Facebook in the same way that they used to because everyone you've ever spoke to is going to have told you about the sort of drama and the sort of shit that goes on on Facebook, regardless of how much they're stealing from you. Cause that's the only reason they exist, right? It's just to get all of your personal and private yeah. information out of you. Everyone you've ever known has said, Oh, don't want to go on Facebook. There's the arguments. There's people slagging each other. So I don't think people <sighs> truly use Facebook the way that we're saying that they do. I don't think anyone does that anymore. No, but I, I actually think this is kind of a philosophical issue. I don't think the human race has ever been so interconnected and things. it's been so easy to talk to people. And what we have got is basically looking ourselves at the mirror is how terrible the human race is. <laughs> really, it's the first time this has ever happened. And this is, this is what's going to happen with any kind of free open system. The human race is just going to be revealed in itself to be this horrible, ugly beast that it's only going to drag us all down to hell. Yeah, so we should try and get rid of it and go back to being in our Sunday bests to meet the yeah. friends and family. Yeah. <laughs> but so, okay, I'm not quite sure how to follow that, but we'll, I'll, I'll just I'll just segue us over this way. The the discussion about Facebook 
from what I've heard, the Ute are not on Facebook. Like, Joe made a joke about um, uh, Friends Reunited as like a thing, you know, our parents did or what have you, and to find their friends when the internet first came around and everyone went on there. But so I'm well and truly of a generation of Facebook and people, you know, uh, my other half and all my friends from home and uni, what have you, are all communicating backwards and forwards on Facebook. But to people who have children, the children look at their parents and go, Facebook, my dad's using that as if I'm going to fucking use that. And so they find something else. So in my mind, Facebook has a problem because it you can't be cool and have everyone on it. That It just doesn't go together, does it? Being cool is that you're doing something edgy and different. And so we may well be the last people who are worrying about Facebook before the next big social media thing, whether that be Instagram or Twitter or something else. Well, it already is those. It's your uh, your Snapchat and your Instagram. They are already, like, for the next generation, that's what's already being used. And not quite for the purposes we had for it. But Jesse raises a good point here, and that is that people inevitably move on. They moved on from MySpace, and now they're starting to move on from Facebook. And the, the young people definitely have avoided Facebook. So... Does that not present an opportunity to those of us in the free and open source world and people who uh, care about decentralization and open standards and everything to create something that is attractive to them? How how do you make something like that and make it cool enough that youngsters want to join it and, and take part in it? You can't. It would be socially irresponsible for us to create something targeting the young people, knowing <laughs> what we know about social media, then to create something to trap them again. I don't mean like young, young people. I mean like, you know, kids in their early 20s. People who are, you know, cool, for want of a better word. Wait, so I'm not cool now? Just because I'm no longer in my mid-20s? Yeah. Joe, fuck you, I'm leaving. <laughs> like I said, don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> so really, the conclusion of all this is... Uh, that none of these alternatives have got a chance and that it's going to be some horrible proprietary data slurping service that everyone's going to be on, whether it is Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, or whatever the next thing is. But just make sure when you're leaving these services that you do it properly. Yeah, there's a pretty cool script that a guy called Kevin Matthew has written, which goes through all your Facebook posts and edits them and puts in just gibberish. So if you are going to leave Facebook, then it leaves them with not much useful data although you do have to wonder if they've got backups and stuff which they probably have and that data has been scraped by a lot of people already so it's kind of um a defiant fuck you to facebook as you leave but that's it's pretty cool nonetheless um and i suppose we should talk about the firefox uh, facebook container extension which pretty much logs you out of Facebook and then only logs you in in one tab and then that tab can't talk to any other tab so you can't be tracked across the internet which is something you could have done with their containers anyway but this sort of makes it really specific to Facebook and it's kind of packaged in a way that is easier to use for normals so um, it's something I'm definitely going to recommend to people that I know who use Facebook and maybe it can drag them back from Chrome but I don't know I think that's pissing in the wind as well isn't it at this point uh, so what have we concluded then, Joe? That we're all fucked and that humanity is doomed. <laughs> it's a nice bit of marketing from um, Firefox, though. I like it. Yeah, I, I think that it's where they need to stand out, isn't it, doing stuff like this? Yeah, I do think people care. I do think people are growing more and more aware of this as an issue. And, I, you know, on a slightly optimistic point, I do think there may be a threshold or at least enough pressure placed, placed on these big companies, they may have to take privacy more seriously or the proof of privacy. I do think that people are un at least understand the issue. Yeah, I think when one issue comes out, like uh, the Snowden revelations, y you sort of thought, from, well, from my point of view, I kind of thought, right, this is it, this is the big landslide moment, but nothing really major happened to the general public or the, or the way it was viewed. Uh, and it does require, I think a number like an attrition for 
things to keep on coming out and keep on saying, look, this is bad and it's social media. This is bad and it's people collecting data. This is bad and it's your data online. And, and it gets to the point where, you know, slowly but surely minds are changed and slowly but surely the general view on it is changed. It's not going to happen overnight, Yeah. but this is just another, unfortunately, we have to go through all these things over and over and over again for people to... Um, have made up names on the internet or think yeah. twice about, you know, locking into everything with Facebook or whatever. Yeah, it ripples in the pond, doesn't it? You know, you throw one stone, you're not going to make a big splash, but you keep throwing enough stones and soon that surface is not going to stay stable. Yeah, here's hoping. Um, all right, well, we'd better wrap it up, but uh, people will be shouting at us if I don't ask you, Graham, what the fuck's <laughs> going on with Linux Voice and the podcast. I, I, I knew you were going to ask me this and... I can't give you a definitive answer. I've told pe- over the last four months, has it been now? I've told people it's definitely coming back. It's still definitely coming back. I've told people today it's definitely coming back. However, the, the four of us are finding it very difficult to kind of get our thoughts together, honestly, and um, kind of organise ourselves to, to to make it happen. And that's all that's really getting in the way. There's been a lot of stuff going on in the background that nobody would be really interested in. Um, but really, all that's stopping it is all of us saying, right, let's meet up next Thursday and uh, record something. Um, I'm really hopeful it's going to happen. I miss it. Uh, but I can't say that we've got anything for certain. Because people said to me privately when I was discussing who we were going to go with for uh, IKEA's replacement, that if we brought you on board here, it's pretty much the death of Linux Voice as a podcast. And I feel like I'm having an affair, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually quite exciting. <laughs> Wait, I'm being replaced by someone who's having an affair. I'm not yeah. sure how this sits with me. Well, <laughs> you're 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 leaving for the higher holy up, upper ground. So over the younger model bike. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we'll see if you ever get your shit together with the next voice podcast again. But uh, you better do Foss Talk Live because he promised. Yeah. No. I do. I think we will. I think we will. But you know, I've been saying it for four months, and actually, it's it's my fault. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, we'll be back in two weeks uh, with Graham and Will, and hopefully Phelan will be off the toilet by then. Um, so, yes. Good night, sweet prince, Ike. Um, I, where can people find you if they want to continue to follow you after you've left this? Probably working on my van. Like, you won't really get much <laughs> of there. Uh, Google Plus, probably even in the Telegram, like, I'll be haunting that place still. So. You know, I make a lot of noise. It's it's kind of hard to go around the internet and not know that I'm there. So you'll find me. Yeah. So Google Plus or Telegram. Yeah. And uh, Jesse, you kind of use Twitter a bit, but not much. No, I have to admit, of all this social media stuff, I, I generally don't really give a shit what other people do. So I don't really look at it very much or post what I do. So I'll, I'll be back. Don't worry, Joe. Yeah. Well, good luck with the baby and everything. And Ike, good luck with your life and everything. Um, so uh, yeah we'll be back in two weeks in the meantime I've been John I've been Jesse I'll see you shortly I've been Graham and for the last time I'm Mikey see you later